perfect. All right, guys, thank you so much. I know it is a Tuesday. It's a school night for all you young folks. Uh, so uh, we're going to get started here again for those of you that are just joining, which probably is nobody. You guys have been waiting here for 16 minutes. Um, you're not going to be able to see me, but you you should be able to see my screen. So um, throughout this, this presentation, again, thank you for your patience. Um, you guys are very, very welcome to, to uh, step in with any questions that you have um, uh, on this, this webinar. So uh, what I'm going to be doing is, is uh, going through this presentation, going through the slideshow. If you guys have any questions about the topic that we're talking about at that specific moment, you guys are more than welcome to ask a question. I love answering questions. That's where some of the best information comes from uh, during these webinars. And uh, yeah, so it's 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 always good to ask questions uh, as long as we're talking about the uh, the the subject uh, at hand. And then at the end of the webinar, I'm going to stay on for as as long as I need to to answer all of your questions. So thank you guys again. So let's get started. We're going to be talking about uh, summer uh, bass tactics. Now that's a really wide subject, um, but uh, we're going to be talking about some of the things that that I really look for during the summertime. It doesn't matter what lake I'm on. Um, these are things that I really tend to, to look for. Um, of course, you know, everything varies. You know, there's always situations where you're gonna run into something that's kind of off the wall during summertime. But these are the things that if I'm going to a new lake, these are things that I'm always gonna look for right off the bat. So let's get started. And again, my name is Miles Berghoff. If you guys don't know me, uh, I fish the FLW Pro Circuit. Really excited to get back to the season. We got Lake Chickamauga coming up with the, the new super tournament format. I'd love to hear your opinion on that. Um, I absolutely love it, but it's it's going to be really exciting. I've been working with Navionics, who is the sponsor of this, this webinar for many, many years. They're my longest lasting sponsor. And uh, so I'm really just happy for them to, to give me this platform to share this information. Let's get started. Oh my gosh, and we got somebody from Australia. John Debris. Love it. From down under. Dig it. That was that was a terrible, terrible way to say that. So, all right. So we're going to be looking at summertime patterns to look for. Um, the the general topics we're going to be talking about, main lake structure. OK, um, we're going to be talking about ledge and current patterns, which kind of mixes in with main lake structure. But I, I kind of uh, separate the two. And then we're going to be talking about some grass patterns that I look for during the summertime and then some forage patterns. Those are the ones that kind of get overlooked a lot and uh, and don't tend to be as as um, as uh, uh, readily uh, apparent to, to a lot of people. Somebody says that they just lost audio. I hope that's not for everybody. All right. So let's talk about main lake structure. Now, throughout this, this slide, I'm, I'm more or less kind of talking about lakes that aren't necessarily um, a current driven. So lakes that are highland lakes where, you know, even if they're pulling a little bit of current for power generation or whatever they've got going on, uh, it's really not a current driven bite. So the structure that I'm fishing is very different than what you would expect to see on say the, the Tennessee River um, on Lake Chickamauga, for instance. And, uh, and so that just keep in mind, that's kind of what I'm talking about. So in general, and, and I need to kind of preface this by saying that I'm generally a shallow water fisherman, a shallow water power fisherman. Uh, but since I have really got to understand electronics and get better with my electronics, I really increase the amount of, of time that I spend offshore uh and uh and fishing fishing in deeper situations um but uh in general after the spawn a lot of the fish and i would venture to say the vast majority of the fish in a lake are going to move um uh, move out deep okay they're going to start relating to to different types of, of deep structure the the oxygen levels are really good deep you know, the forager tend, that generally tend to be deep because the temperature ranges and the oxygen levels, they're just a perfect mixture out there. Um, not all fish are gonna move deep, but when I'm looking at these highland reservoirs or these reservoirs that aren't current driven, and, and a lot of these will work, also work for current driven lakes, so don't let me 
kind of um, uh, talk you out of that. But uh, what I'm looking for once these fish start relating to the main lake, and this is my personal preference, I just want you guys to know that, um, I look for longer sloping structures. So uh, such as uh, uh, long sloping main lake points, humps, saddles, and uh, some main river contours. Um, and, and the reason I like the main, uh, the, the long sloping structures is, I mean, honestly, that's what I, I grew up fishing offshore is I love those offshore structures uh, that are really, really slowly sloping. They're easy to find in Navionics uh, uh, maps. And what, what happens is during the summertime, these, these fish really do stock these, these bait fish. And when those bait fish end up coming close to that structure, it's a really, really good type of structure to where those fish can push those bait fish into shallow water. And so that's why I'm looking for those, those very long sloping points. And those fish can, can really find a, a stretch on that structure that they really like. So, um, and, uh, you know, the way that I kind of approach these, these longer structures is the same way that I approach any type of structure. Um, I like to, uh, to first start out with my, my wide range sonar, which is my side imaging, side scan, whatever you want to call it. That type of technology is so well suited for scanning large areas and not necessarily finding the fish. You can find the fish, especially if you're looking for the shadows um, on the sonar. However, I try to find those hard spots, those areas where the maybe a point or a hump is is falling uh, quicker, you know, a steeper um, edge. Uh, maybe there's a hard spot like some shell or some rock. Uh, and then also brush piles, things of that nature, a stump all by itself. Anything that's different from the rest of the point, that's what I'm looking for. So I'll go side to side after I isolate the, the structure that I'm looking for and then find that little spot on the spot. And sometimes those, even when you do find that spot on the spot, it's not necessarily where those fish are at that time. But a lot of times what you'll see is those fish will actually use that that brush pile. I'll 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 use uh, Lake Lanier for instance. Those spotted bass really like to hang out in those brush piles, and then all of a sudden, as soon as the bait fish kind of come around, they'll vacate those brush piles. They'll go schooling, and then they'll come back to them later. So, it, you know, they may not be on those little isolated pieces of cover, but eventually they will. Uh, and uh, you know, oh, sorry. There we go. Um, and you know, one thing that I don't want anybody to overlook is also main lake flats. Um, flats can hold fish, but the main thing that I'm looking for if I go to a main lake flat is I'm going to look at um, it, it, and see if there's grass. And, and we're gonna be talking about grass uh, a little bit later. So um, uh, we'll kind of leave that for right now. So, so far we've got a question. And we keep on going over to Bass Fan, which is all right because I, I, uh, I dig Bass Fan, but I'm trying to figure out how to. There we go. All right, so um, we've got a question: How far will bass travel to to go to deep water? That's a really good question. So generally, uh, bass can travel miles upon miles. They will go a very, very long distance, but there's there's several different types of fish in every single lake that I've been to personally. And this is just my personal observation. Um, there's, I'm sure that there's some science to back this up, but in general, there when you have fish that that tend to make that that transition from really shallow in the back of a bay or a creek or a pocket or something like that and they tend to go offshore every summer, those are a certain type of fish that do that year in and year out. They, they tend to go in big groups and they'll, they'll spawn in these certain areas and then they'll make the long trip back out to some of the best suitable cover. And sometimes they'll go a very short distance um, to get on suitable cover that's really good to intercept bait fish. And sometimes they'll go miles 
on, upon miles. You know, I've seen I've seen old Bassmaster, uh, uh, you know, coverage of where they used to put the the radio tracking device in the bass, and it would travel, you know, ten miles or something like that. So they do travel quite a bit. It just depends on how far they need to go to uh, intercept the bait and find that structure that really allows them to to be efficient at intercepting the bait. All right, so here are two screenshots of uh, on my Navionics app on my on my iPad. Um, this is kind of the the type of structure that I'm I'm kind of looking at. So on the left hand side, you can see we've got a point that kind of juts out and it kind of forks off. Okay, and uh, so we've got a lot of different qualities. Uh, technically, we've got we've got saddles. So in between the 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 um, the blue spot and the point that kind of forks off, um, that is, is going to be considered a saddle. It's just a low spot between two high spots. And then we've got a hump, which is the very end of that, 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 uh, that what was the point turned into the, the saddle and then had a hump. It's just essentially a, kind of a roundish a high spot on the contour map. And you can see that by the light blue. And uh, so that's the kind of stuff that I really like to look for. And really, it, you know, they may be on one certain type of structure at, at, on a certain day or on a certain lake. But generally, if you find a, a good hump uh, outside uh, the, you know, adjacent to or adjacent to, to uh, uh, you know, a good spawning bay, that is generally going to be a really good piece of structure. And the same thing goes for, for a saddle, same thing goes for a long point. So those are all things that I look for. And on the right-hand screenshot, we've got a, uh, a what I consider a saddle. Again, that's a good example because it's the saddle between two islands and that's denoted by the, the crosshairs there. Okay, so let's uh, look at the questions real quick. Again, it's just gonna keep on bringing me back over here, but we will go back. That's a good screensaver though. I dig it, Bass fan. Um, how deep is the water I'm referring to? Um, uh, you know, deep water is all relative. I mean, when you really look at it, I'm talking about 10 foot or deeper. Uh, is generally what I consider deeper water. Now, that's, you know, it's probably not the greatest definition because, I mean, if you really look at it, 10 foot is nothing. And if you really look at it, 20 foot isn't much of anything either. It's just your boat pretty much stood on end. Um, so, so 20 foot is considered pretty deep water in bass fishing. But generally, when I'm saying deep water, I'm talking anything deeper than 10 foot is what I would consider deeper water. All right, and we got another question. Let me go back. Not sure why it kicks me out every time. Um, so a hard spot, uh, does a hard spot mean hard, mean hard bottom? Yes. So the hard spots that I'm referring to are, are whatever type of hard bottom is there. Sometimes on, on certain lakes, it's, it's called a shell bed, you know, where there's a, a, a grouping of, of, you know, invertebrates and, and, uh, and shellfish that are living there. And they create these, these really hard bottom shell beds. Usually they're on top of sand or anything, something like that. That's a, that's a hard spot. And it's actually fairly easy to find these hard spots using your sonar. Um, when on side imaging or down scan, when you see a, a brighter spot than the surrounding area or the surrounding structure, there's two things that that could be. It could either be harder bottom or it could be a, a rising contour. Okay, so it's essentially just showing you where the, um, the, the uh, sonar beam actually got a, a stronger return, um, which could be hard bottom or a, a a contour that's sloping up. But that's generally what I'm looking for. And during the summertime, um, on these type of lakes that that are highland reservoirs, not a whole lot of current, where these fish are on these long sloping contours, this is when I'm going to be looking for rock, you know, rock or gravel, anything hard like that. It's really good to throw a Carolina rig or a heavy um, uh, football jig to be able to find those areas if you don't have good sonar technology. 
uh, and uh, and just in general, it's that's a really good way to to find those hard spots. But that's what I'm talking about. Anything that's harder is is what I uh, am referring to. So let's kind of breeze through some of these questions. Okay, cool. So I didn't realize you guys you guys could see my mouse on my screen. So um, real quick, uh, since I, I can show you with the mouse. So what I'm referring to when I'm talking about long sloping structures, and this is kind of a good uh, opportunity to kind of talk about contours. When you've got these contour lines on your Navionics map that are really, really close together, that denotes a, a much steeper uh, structure. So when they're close together, it's very, very steep, sloping very fast. And then as soon as you get on top here, we've got these, these lines that are, are further apart that means that the contours are very slowly sloping. And you can also see here, we've got the, the um, depth shading on to a certain range. So you can see that it's shaded in blue, all right? And that's a really good way to, to be able to find these, these long sloping structures and these humps and things like that. And the hump is right here and the saddle would be right here. Of course, we got it on this side too. Um, but, uh, you know, the the, a color shading is really good for this because you can set it to a certain depth. So if you think that the fish are in 15 feet, you can set it to 15 feet and it'll shade all the structures that stay in that range. Where are we going? All right, so that's kind of what I'm, I'm talking about. Oops. All right, so, all right, so there's a few things uh, we'll talk about. So uh, somebody's asking about a certain lake, Lake Wachita in central Arkansas. It's really, really clear. How does that affect things? So the cool thing about a clear lake during the summertime on this type of structure, these long sloping points, these humps and things like that, I love this type of structure for that because um, it, it really allows you to fish power fishing tactics. Those fish really have a wide strike zone. And when I say a wide strike zone, I'm saying that they have a, a, a longer distance that they will travel to eat bait fish. When it's muddier, they don't want to, they don't want to move a lot. And in fact, they don't use their, their sense of sight as much. So they're not going to move a long distance, but in clear water, you can really use power fishing tactics such as jerk baits or, um, you know, uh, walking top waters and things like that. So clear water is actually your friend on this type of structure. You just have to use faster moving baits or you have to scale it down and go really ultra finesse in that clear water. And as far as the thermocline goes, uh, that's a really good question because thermoclines really do affect the fishing in this type of lake that I'm talking about because the current isn't, you know, constantly, uh, you know, circulating through the system and a thermocline will develop. And for, for those of you that don't know what a thermocline is, it's a, a layer of, of water that has a mixture of oxygen and temperature ranges that drastically change at a certain point. So on your depth finder, I, it'll actually show like a sandwich, you know, it'll be, it'll be super clear, you know, say down to 10 foot and it changes based on the lake and the time of the year. Then all of a sudden at that 10 foot range, you start seeing, you know, like it's just kind of fuzzy. It just kind of looks weird. And then uh, below that at a certain range, it'll clear back up. That's the thermocline. That's where the oxygen level is, is generally very rich um, in, within that certain range. And it's at a very good cooler temperature range. And so it's, it's essentially just in between the, the higher level, um, what they call the epilimnion, if you really want to get uh, scientific, even though I probably pronounced it wrong. And, uh, and the, the bottom layer. So the bottom layer is gonna be very uh, low oxygen. It's gonna be very cold. 
and then the top layer is is going to be probably too hot and it's it also can be lower oxygen and that thermocline that the the fuzziness that you're seeing in the thermocline is actually you know all that plankton all the bait fish everything that wants to be in that zone um so that's what the thermocline is and the reason why that's so important for this type of lake and this type of fishing offshore is the fact that uh, if you have a thermocline that develops and you see it on your screen, you see that little band of, of interference on your screen, that's when you take your Navionics app or you take whatever you, you're using with your Navionics maps and you color shade down to that depth. So when you color shade down to that depth, you can see all the structure that touches that that depth range, that thermocline range, and that's usually a really, really good spot to start fishing and uh, that generally fish will relate to that zone very, very, um, very, very much during the summer. All right, and I may, because we got started a little bit late, I may, uh, uh, you know, skip over a couple questions, but Okay, so let's go ahead and um, go down. Let's talk about some of the, the lures that I'm using for this type of fishing. All right, so for reaction baits, again, the clearer the water, I like to start with reaction baits, and usually it's something like a walking topwater bait, like a Zara Spook or, you know, uh, all the other, you know, walking baits out there on the market. Some, some of them have a little cup mouth on it, uh, and they spit a lot. You can use those. Um, there's a wide variety of baits, but really those walking baits, that side to side action that they have and the fact that they cover water, they move forward. They don't just stay in spot at uh, one spot like a, a popper would do or some other top waters. Um, those walking baits really do create a lot of commotion. They really do imitate those pelagic bait fish like shad that are on this type of structure. And that's what those fish are keying in on. So I'll generally start with one of those and uh and i will uh I'll, I'll work from there okay some other baits that are really good are deep diving crank baits you know on these points make sure that you match the the depth that those baits run um to the depth that you're fishing but generally you want a crank bait to go at least two feet deeper uh than than the bottom that you're fishing because you really want it to dig into that bottom Another really good thing is swim baits. You know, the clearer the water, the better the swim bait bite should be. Um, and flutter spoons too. If the fish are really schooled up, they're tight, tightly knit in a pack and they're roaming around, um, a flutter spoon is really, really good and ripping that off the bottom. Other baits, we've already talked about how good football jigs and Carolina rigs are. Football jigs and Carolina rigs are some of my favorite techniques for this type of structure because it allows you to really fine tune um, your presentation there. You can find those hard bottoms because, you know, you use a heavy enough Carolina rig or football jig and you can really just feel that grinding over the shell on the bottom. So it just makes it a whole lot easier. And I just love that feeling where you're just dragging and all of a sudden you start feeling that that kind of like grind feeling, that tick feeling, you're, you're bringing it through shell, you're bringing it through rock, and then all of a sudden you feel that pop, that fish bit. Um, so football heads, um, sea rigs, shaky heads are also very good. If you have to downsize Nico rigs or something I've really been exploring recently, drop shots and big worms. Big worms on the screen, you can see the Z-Man Mag Fatties worm. I'll generally use that on a Texas rig, usually a quarter ounce, maybe even more if it's deep. Um, and then uh, like a mag shaky head, a really big shaky head with that bait because it's a really big presentation. So those are the baits that I'm going to be generally using. All right, and let's look at some of the questions here. All right, so uh, when trying to, uh, to find uh, uh, ledge, ledges to fish, do you, I need to look for ledges that are parallel or perpendicular to the current? This is a really good question. It's actually in the next um, uh, group of, of slides. So I'm gonna wait for that, but, uh, but 
wanted to give a shout out to Matt. What's going on, man? And Larry and my buddy Mitch. Happy birthday, belated. Um, all right, so let's look at another. All right, so Rick asked, do buzz baits work well as a walk as well as a walking surface bait? Buzz baits can work well. There, I'm just telling you the the baits that generally you know will be top of my mind for fishing this type of stuff. Of course, it's fishing, man. There's all kinds of stuff that'll work in different situations. You never know what you need to try. But um, I haven't really, you know, I've caught fish off of long sloping structure with buzz baits. If it's really, really shallow and I'm casting to the shallow water, a buzz bait is definitely really good. But generally I'm fishing, you know, walking baits. I feel like I call fish from longer distances and deeper water with those walking baits. All right. So now let's talk about ledges and current related structure. Um, all right, and, and when I'm talking about ledge fishing, generally I'm talking about uh, a river system such as Gunnersville, Chickamauga here. Um, I'm off limits, so you can't tell me anything about Chickamauga, but we've got that tournament coming up. And so all these things are top of my mind right now. Um, and, uh, and so in current driven fisheries where you're really talking about a river system, um, uh, ledges are in current breaking uh, structures are really big patterns. That's what you all hear about. And ledges are kind of a broad term. They're something that that people kind of overuse that that uh, terminology. But to me, what it is is it's it's a um, it's a, a term used for steep main lake structure, which are usually uh, you know related to original river or creek and channel edges okay and i'll give you some some uh examples of that in the next slide um and bass in summer like out here on chickamauga or, or gunnersville they love living on these ledges and the reason for that is that they that they're constantly getting food brought to them with the current that's why current is such a big deal um uh when you're fishing lakes like this can't see behind my why on earth does it do that frustrating um but uh so and these fish will be found on stretches that are are either facing into the current okay that's something that i learned when i moved to, to chickamauga and we're gonna be talking about that and generally they'll be on the irregular shaped ledges that are parallel to the current matt was asking about you know whether they're going to be on a perpendicular uh, uh, ledges or some that are parallel generally all of the ledges that i'm fishing and i'm no no uh, i'm not the top of the food chain when it comes to ledge fishing let me say that but i'm learning a lot out here on chickamauga and i really do enjoy it and i've man i have gone a long distance for, from just a few years ago and i'll tell you one thing that blew my mind is the fact that the majority of the biggest schools, the mega schools that I've found are all on structure that are perpendicular to the cover or to the current. <clears throat> so they're facing into the current. So originally when I first started out, I thought that that fish would be relating to the eddy side of, of a ledge. So say the, the, the current's coming from the north and then the ledge drops off on the south edge of the, the, the creek channel or it would drop off on the south edge so you would have a, an eddy there but no fish actually really like being on that front edge so if you have a a, a a ledge that is facing up current they're generally right there on that right in the current and uh, and feeding that way and so i look for ledges that that look into the current and uh, and i also look for those those straight areas where the the ledge is parallel with the uh, with the current but the there may be a little bit of a, a point that kind of juts out and creates that 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 um, uh, up current facing structure, if that makes sense. We'll kind of get into that in, in one of the slides coming up next. Um, and for current breaking, if you're like on a, a true river system, it's shallow water. You're not talking about fishing, you know, out deep. Um, a shallow structure such as wing dams on on uh, rivers are really really key and the fish tend to actually be on the the back side or the eddy side of those if you're talking about heavy heavy current so 
on offshore lakes like Chickamauga and Gunnersville that, that are technically river systems, but they're bigger and the fish tend to stay out deeper. I like to, to look for those, those up current facing structures uh, as opposed to the, the eddy areas that I would fish in, uh, in the smaller rivers. Okay, and, and usually that, that is just because the fact that the current is more condensed, it's stronger, and, uh, and it's harder for those fish to stay in those, those high current areas on those, those smaller rivers. All right, let's look at, um, let's look at some questions here. You know what, we're gonna change this to Navionics as a background, since we keep on going back to it. All right. We're gonna wait for some of these questions until the very end. If I skip over your question now, wait until the end and I'll answer it for you. Or you can send me an email at sonar at sonarfishing.com and I can answer it there. Uh, John Debris, yeah, I, I absolutely. What I'm talking about does include the old river bed, the old river channel. Um, uh, good question here. So we've got a question that that asks that um, when fishing current, do you need to lead your target to account for the bait being pushed? Now, yes. Um, it, the deeper water you fish and the stronger the current, you're definitely going to have to account for that. Generally on ledge, uh, ledge type situations, the, you know, uh, where you're talking about broader uh, rivers, you know, broader lakes, the, the, the current kind of isn't as condensed. So you don't have to worry about that as much. So I generally don't do that too much, but I always tend to cast past the structure and bring it to it. You never want the, the bait other than a few different types of baits to, to just land right on those fish. So yeah, I would cast past it and then work your way up. All right, so let's, um, let's go back to the presentation here and we'll go to the next slide because the next question really does uh, uh, kind of relate to that. So here are three different screenshots of some ledges that I'm talking about. Now, these are on Gunnersville. I have no idea if, if these are, are holding fish or not. Um, and I probably even shouldn't have, have mentioned the lake that it was on. But anyways, I've, I haven't fished these. I just picked them out because this is the kind of typical things that I look for on these type of lakes that, that have high current. Um, so right here on the biggest screen here, you can see I've got my cursor. We've got this, this crosshair pointed on this. So we've got this high spot that's denoted by this, this, the blue shading here. And then we've got the creek channel. Of course, we've got the tight contour lines that, that uh, show you that it is a steeper sloping structure. And essentially what it is, is this is a creek, old creek channel that comes out from this, this creek, this bay here, and then kind of broadens out, out here and then squiggles out into the main river channel and, and dumps into what used to be the river. Um, Darn it. And uh, so what I'm looking for, the current is coming from uh, the right going left in this situation. And so this right here, you can see that that this is where the, the ledge is. That's where the drop is. It's facing into the current, which is coming from the right. And uh, and so that's the type of thing that I look for, especially outside of a major spawning bay, a creek, whatever it is that's where those fish are going to be funneling out of they're going to be coming out of this spawning bay they're going to be following these contours and then all of a sudden they hit things like this right here this part of the ledge and this part of the ledge right here the current is coming right into it bringing all that bait fish and that's what i'm looking for and you can actually idle this entire ledge right here but generally all of the fish are going to be on this side following uh, you know the 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 up current facing structure as opposed to the down current structure which is right on this side so this is where i'm going to put all my my time but this right here is a hot spot that's a hot spot that's a hot spot and uh, going on to this one right here top uh, right hand side same thing so you got a creek channel that kind of parallels the main river channel and but then all of a sudden it makes this kind of like turn and goes right in and dumps right into the the, the original river channel this right here creates a ledge 
you know, this is the parallel structure that we're talking about. It's just a straight ledge that's going parallel with the, the current. But then all of a sudden, now you've got this straight kind of perpendicular 90 degree turn that creates that, that ledge that faces up current. Um, so the current's coming from, from the top, going down, and it's hitting right there. So a lot of fish will, will hang out on those. Any type of a regular structure like that, little points, pockets, indentations in the, uh, in the uh, ledges, that's what I'm looking for. Got to get a sip. Man, sorry, I'm, I'm powering through this because we got started late. But um, all right, and so now on the bottom uh, right hand part of the or bottom right hand uh, screenshot, we've got another piece of structure that I look for. A lot of these lakes have these little islands uh, that used to be, you know, uh, high and dry when the, the, the river was at its original levels. But now they've created these high spots, which you can consider uh, humps. But I like to focus on the very tip of these these islands, these old islands, and uh, and generally they'll have some stumps, things like that. But that's a really really good spot. Again, the current is just barreling right into it. So, all right. So let's talk about let's look at some of these questions. Okay, so uh, that's a really good question. Uh, a lot of you have likely heard about angles being key for ledge fishing that is so important for any offshore fishing now with ledge fishing the the conditions kind of make it you know the perfect for you because i like to um face so say i'm fishing this structure right here any of these so i like to go down current from the structure that i'm casting to and so i'll cast from you know about three quarters of a cast length away. So I'll, I'll be casting probably, you know, I'll probably have the boat 60 or 70 feet away from, from the ledge. That way I can make a long cast to it. I'm not right on top of those fish, but I'll be casting up current. That's 95% of the way that I'm targeting these. There's every once in a while, I'll find a situation where I have to go and hit it from maybe the side. I'll still be down current. And then sometimes I have to hit it from parallel, which is very, very rare. And then sometimes isn't as rare. It's probably the second most common. I have to go up current and cast back to them. But that's still relatively rare because you really want to bring, those fish are gonna be facing up current into that current and you wanna bring that bait into their face as opposed to uh, you know coming uh, against that current and into their tail. So you wanna bring it with the current pretty much at all times. The short answer. So uh, quite, this is another good question. Which way do you know, do you know which way the, the current is coming from? How do you know that? So generally, you know, in these river systems, they make it pretty easy because they generally look like a river on the map and you know that it's coming from, um, you know, north to south. Um, and, uh, you know, on some lakes like Kentucky Lake, it goes from south to north. And generally what I like to do is I like to drive by a, a buoy and uh, or something, you know, floating and see which way the current is going and how fast the current is going. Um, that's really, really key, because if the current, if they're not pulling current on that particular day, you're out for a very long, tough day of fishing out on these ledges. So it's really important to know whether or not the current is running. So good question. Just kind of be aware and, and kind of look for those current breaks on on buoys. Yeah, so so I may have been uh, a little bit confusing. Yeah, on this first slide right here on on the left hand slide uh, side. So this current right here. So this this like this this um, picture is of Gunnersville, and the current is coming from the right hand side and going this way because the so the dam is going to be um, the dam which is is pouring the water out of this lake. Is going to be on the left hand side down river and this kind of snakes up north so i know it's probably a little bit confusing let's move on so let's talk about some baits i got to get this out of the way and of course that's going to slide over there um <clears throat> all right so ledge baits 
this is pretty exciting because I've really started to really love fishing offshore, fishing ledges. I'm probably going to be doing a lot of it um, at the upcoming FLW event. Um, and these are the baits that I reach for. Hopefully there's no other FLW guys here or MLF guys, but these are the baits that I'm reaching for. These are, uh, you know, a first I'll try for reaction baits such as flutter spoons, hair jigs, and hair jigs are, are really special. The way that you fish a hair jig is essentially cast it out there. You're not bouncing it on the bottom. You're reeling it, as soon as it hits the bottom, you're reeling it as fast as you can, maybe four cranks, letting it fall back to the bottom and getting a reaction bite. You can do that all the way back to the boat. It's a very exciting way to catch them. It's something that, that I just started doing like four years ago. It's pretty cool. And then big crank baits and swim baits are all staples for ledge fishing. And you just got to, with ledge bites, you got to rotate through a variety of baits. You can't just show up with one bait. There's never a time when you can just show up with one bait and always, always catch them on the same lake day, day in and day out. Why did you do that? Um, and so I'll rotate between the reaction baits first, see if I can get them to react. And then if I can't, and I know they're there because I saw them on the graph, I'll go to the bottom bouncing techniques. Drop shots, even though it's one of my least favorite tactics of all time, drop shots with a, just a, you know, a little six inch worm are hard to beat on the Tennessee River and a lot of these ledge lakes. They, for some reason, these fish love drop shots. Um, big worms are also something that you cannot leave the house without. A uh, big worm like the mag fatties from Z-Man that we just talked about. Uh, the plum color is absolutely my favorite color during the summertime. It doesn't matter where I go, they eat that color. Um, for some reason, plum, red bug, June bug, all those colors tend to do really, really well on these ledge lakes. And then uh, football jigs like the one that you can see there um, and, uh, and Nico rigs. Those are all baits that I use. And, and generally, you know, in the football jig is actually, it belongs in both categories, reaction and bottom bouncing, um, because you can either drag that, that puppy or you can stroke it off the bottom. You can rip it off the bottom really fast, you know, four or five feet and let it fall all the way back down and, uh, and get reaction bites. So you can fish it like, a, like you're fishing a flutter spoon uh, on the bottom. All right, let's look at any questions. All right, good fishing or good question, Mike. Uh, ledge fishing, do your swim baits need to stay on the bottom? So yes, the way that I fish a swim bait uh, ledge fishing is extremely slow. Make This is one thing that I had to learn the hard way. It took me a long time to learn it, but you're essentially using a heavy jig or you know swim bait head and you're just slowly reeling as slow as you have to to where you're constantly making bottom contact i mean sometimes you're not barely even moving the handle at all but as long as it's just kind of grinding on the bottom that's the best way to catch them uh, usually sometimes you can catch them where you know you're keeping it in the water column and keeping it fairly um steady but Day in and day out, the best way to catch them is to grind that swim bait on the bottom. All right, so let's start getting into my personal wheelhouse that I've, you know, has been my wheelhouse for forever. And that's shallow water fishing and grass fishing and grass patterns are definitely part of that. Um, so let me get this out of the way here. That is just frustrating. But it's the lesser of two evils. I'm, you know, at least we have audio now. All right. So grass patterns. Grass is a an absolute bass magnet during this time of year, during the summertime, and uh, it produces oxygen. It cleans the water. It just makes a very stable environment for those fish. It attracts bait fish. It's just good all around. Um, and uh, and you know, really, the type of grasses that I look for are hydrilla and milfoil. However. I'll, I'll look for eelgrass as well. There's some lakes that eelgrass plays a big role. Gunnersville is choked out with eelgrass. Um, there's a couple spots with eelgrass and on Chickamauga and other lakes, but uh, eelgrass can be good. It's not one of my favorites, but it's pretty good. Um, and other types of grass like coontail, it's more regional preference for bass. Uh, sometimes they'll like, you know, coontail, but I generally just look for hydrilla and milfoil. 
Uh, and during this time of the year, I'm looking for main lake grass. So I'm looking for those, those high, high spots, those long sloping structures, um, you know, anything that's, that has a, a large area, a large flat where that grass can grow, that's where I'm looking for. And I'm generally looking on the main river or close to it. In current, you know, anywhere where, where those, those fish have moved out deep, and some fish will just move into the grass instead of staying out real in, in real deep structure. Um, and grass fishing is is it can be very frustrating because you can fish the most beautiful grass for a mile, and then all of a sudden you hit the school, you hit the mother load, and you can load the boat. So it's all a matter of of finding those those areas. And sometimes the majority of the time, I would say I just go fish it. I just go fishing for and fish a whole stretch until I find those fish. But sometimes you can use your electronics and you can find, you know, very varying thicknesses of grass. Um, and sometimes you can even once you get really good, you can figure out what types of grass are mixing together and you can find the irregular edges, the hard spots, which are usually denoted by a clearing of the grass, um, those sort of things. Um, but generally speaking, I'm just fishing it. So let's look at some of the questions we got. So Art asked, how do, how do I find grass uh, or can I just see it because I'm in shallow water? Good question. Uh, electronics, you can find grass very, very easy. I wish I had an example of it um, on the, as far as on my screen here, but essentially what grass is gonna look like is it's, it's gonna look like these these kind of long stalks of, of uh, very inconsistent bottom. The best way to, to really describe it is, is kind of comparing it to a flat bottom. So if you've got just hard structure, you know, it, it's, it generally looks smooth on the graph and uh, you might have a little blip that denotes a rock or a stump here and there, but generally, you know, it's, it's a very solid signal. It, you know, it just looks like the bottom. And then all of a sudden grass, if it's it'll start just kind of looking like a uh, a little bit of interference sometimes and depending on how that interference looks on your screen you can tell what type of grass it is whether it's hydrilla uh, milfoil eelgrass is so easy to find because it's actually it almost looks like a rock you're going over a rock because it's so tightly packed so i'm using my electronics and i just kind of you know the best way to to figure it out is to to uh, I'll go idle an area with your electronics that you know has grass and that way you can kind of see it. Um, the grass, the baits that I use in the grass include reaction baits and bottom bouncing baits. Pretty much all of these different uh, categories have both have both of those. Um, the baits that I'm going to be using the majority of the time include for reaction baits, chatter baits, the best bait there is as far as reaction bait and grass, um, swim bait, and swim jigs. Those are, you know, pretty standard fare for, for fishing in the grass. And then if I need to slow down and really pick apart an area, that's when I'm going to pick up a Texas rig worm or creature bait and just slowly work the edges of the grass. And maybe, you know, and then and then if the grass is really thick, but then it also has some clearings in it, maybe there's some harder bottoms, some little holes in it um, where I can visually see the holes. That's when I'll pick up a, a, um, a jig or a creature bait and pitch it, you know, flip it and pitch it into those holes. So those are all baits that I, that I use. All right, let's go to some questions. All right. All right, if there is an area that you know will grow grass in the summer, will you graph it in the winter? to mark hidden structure or bottom type that you might not see when the grass is grown. Man, you are sneaky. You are sneaky, Shannon. Um, yeah, absolutely. You are definitely spot on there because that is something that, that we, it, you know, is, is very, very important during the winter time when it does clear, you want to go look and see if you can find those spot on the spots uh, type areas, maybe a stump out in the middle of this grass flat that was, you know, you could never tell that it was there. Maybe there's a little bit of, of um, a, uh, rock or shell 
man, if you can get out there when the water is really low and you can visually see it with your eyes, that's even better. But with my electronics, I'll definitely do that. If the bottom is clear enough, I'll go out there and, uh, and idle it. Good, good question. <clears throat> All right, and he's at, Jason's asking for me to go back one screen, so I will just for a second while I'm answering this question. Am I staying on top or am I letting it sink? So I'm assuming you're talking about the reaction baits, the, the bottom bouncing baits, I'm definitely letting them sink to the bottom. The reaction baits generally during the summer, other than the chatter bait, which I'll pump you know, in and out of the grass sometimes, sometimes I'll let it fall the way to the bottom and then rip it through the grass. Um, but generally, I'm trying to, to maintain contact with that grass. So if I'm using the swim bait, the swim jig, or the chatter bait, I'm reeling it just fast enough to where it hits the grass occasionally, and I have to rip it free of that grass. That creates the reaction bite, and that's that's 90% of, of the, the techniques that I use. All right, I'm going to move on. All right, so now we're going to be talking about some different uh, uh, forage patterns, all right? So now we're moving away from, from the grass and, uh, and we're gonna be talking about some forage patterns. These are kind of the sneaky little patterns that, that a lot of guys, a lot of tournament guys at the top level are definitely gonna be paying attention to this. But a lot of guys, you know, when you get to, down to the BFL level and things like that, maybe they won't pay attention as much. The shad spawn is one that is probably the most well-known and it's honestly probably the 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 least um, important of all of them for this time of year because generally by the time summer patterns really come into play, the shad spawn has already happened. Um, the shad spawn generally happens at the end of the bass spawn. It's not always that way, so you have to keep an eye on it. But essentially, what what the shad spawn is is it's when the shad really group together, they go shallow and they start spawning on hard objects or any object that their floating eggs uh, can stick to. It's they're they're like they're covered in this like 3M you know adhesive and they stick to anything. So you know floating docks are a really big one. Any type of hard wood cover, um, a, a rocks. Uh, even grass is really big, and they do this generally in low light conditions during the nighttime um, and, and, of course, early morning and uh, late evening hours. Why did it do that? Um, so, so this is a really big deal. If you find a shad spawn, if you fi find those areas where those fish, those shad are visibly you know, uh, uh, just kind of in groups on the shoreline, and it looks like a, a bass is chasing them onto the shoreline. They're actually spawning generally. Um, they're 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 laying those eggs and they're fertilizing those eggs, and uh, and those eggs are sticking to that structure. So if you see that, and another way to see if if a shad spawn is going on is if those shad are following your bait all the way back to the boat. Those fish are generally spawning because uh, they're, you know, they they they're actually, you know, uh, wanting to get it on with your bait. And so, uh, if you see a bunch of shad following your bait, which is a abnormal um, activity, uh, that's that's generally a situation where there's still a residual shad spawn or a shad spawn going on. And sometimes you can actually smell it too, but the, the smell test is not something that I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, lay my money on. All right, so the shad spawn baits that I'm using, of course, we're using baits that imitate shad uh, the majority of the time. Again, I always put like the majority of the time because it's, it's, um, uh, it's, you know, it, 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 there's always caveats and, and there's no general textbook for, for bass fishing. So uh, every once in a while, you'll have to throw something weird. But generally, shad spawn, it's all about spinner baits, swim jigs, buzz baits, swim baits, and, uh, and walking topwaters. Those are the five categories of baits that I really, really have tied on at all times. All right, so Shannon asks, why not a, uh, a, a, a trap in the summertime? Why not? 
You know, the, a, a, a trap or a lipless crankbait is a great bait all year round. In fact, you can use a, a, a rattle trap or, or, you know, any lipless bait as a bottom bouncing bait. You can fish them just like you would like some type of blade bait on the bottom. Um, you can fish these grass flats with a, a lipless crankbait. If that's something that you feel confident in and, and you feel like that's the best way to imitate these bait fish and get these fish to react, a lipless crankbait is a great way. It's just generally not the, the bait that I reach for during this time of year, but it's definitely something that I've done well in the past. So yeah, it's, it's something you gotta pay attention to. All right, so this one right here, the bluegill and panfish spawn is a big one. I want you guys to remember this. If you guys are shallow water fishermen and you don't want to go out deep and go chase those fish out on those ledges and, and on the offshore structure, it's all about the panfish and bluegill spawn. Um, this actually can happen for an extended period of time. Generally, panfish will spawn right after the bass spawn so you know in the low to upper 70s into the 80 80 degree temperature range and uh and they'll they'll spawn in these tight beds that that these tight group of beds that look like honeycombs um you can sometimes see it on your side imaging um or you know your your hummingbird 360 um but visually you'll be able to see most of them too all of a sudden you'll be just going down this bank in the back of a pocket on the side of a um, a ramp or something and you'll see these these groupings they're not bass beds they're not anything else they're they're bluegill and and other types of panfish and let me tell you if you're looking for a big fish pattern that's up shallow during this time of the year during the summer this is a really, really good one because those fish, those big females that had had just spawned and the ones that tend to stay shallow, man, they got a bone to pick with those bluegill. They, those uh, panfish have been terrorizing those bass, trying to sneak on their beds and uh, steal all those eggs. So those those bass not only have a vendetta against these these uh, these bait fish, but it's just one of their favorite uh, foods in general. Um, so a lot of big fish are caught around the bluegill spawn. Um, and uh, and so they'll generally just kind of perimeter the beds. If you find a, a, a bluegill bed, if it, there's clear enough water, you go up there, I guarantee you're gonna see one or two big fish uh, patrolling the edge of that, that bluegill bed. All right, let me look at some of these questions. All right, so we got a good, good question. What about a high or low pressure system coming through? Um, one thing that I'm a little bit different than a lot of guys, I always pay attention to the weather, but I don't always, um, I don't always try to pigeonhole myself, you know, and try to, to, to categorize the weather um, and, and the bite based on the weather. Um, generally speaking, during the summertime, when you have a front moving through, um, the leading edge of that front where you got the clouds, they haven't, you know, the rain and the clouds haven't quite met you yet, but they're right on the horizon. That's when the bite is generally going to be the best. And then when it's passing through, it'll be pretty good. And then immediately after, sometimes it's really good and sometimes it's not. And uh, and generally speaking, also, you know, those high pressure days where the, there's not a cloud in the sky, it's just clear, sunny skies, those can be very, very tough depending on what you're fishing. When you're fishing at ledges or you're fishing docks, they can be the best days. But if you're uh, talking about just general bite um, overall, uh, they can be kind of tough. Ooh, I got my, my buddy Matt Borelli here. What bait do I use in the bluegill bed scenario? Let's get to that. Good segue, man. Good segue. All right. So the bluegill spawn baits. Um, the the whole trick to the bluegill spawn is because you're talking about a grouping of beds in a specific area. Um, you want to make sure that you're using baits that kind of stay in that strike zone longer. So I'm going to be using prop baits. You know, propped uh, topwater baits. Generally, I'm talking about like a a Smithwick um, Devil's Horse, um, you know, and, and other baits of that sort. Um, it, those tend to, to you, you can, you know, kind of pump the rod tip, 
make a move a little bit, create a little bit of racket and let him sit in that strike zone. Same thing with the popper. The popper doesn't have a whole lot of forward movement, but it walks side to side very well and creates a lot of, of, of commotion. And it also imitates a bluegill popping on the surface very well. So a, a popper is really good. Um, buzz baits can also be very good if you're trying to cover water and find those areas with those bluegill beds. I gen once I find a bluegill bed, I'm not going to cast a, a buzz bait over it generally. I'll usually throw a, a prop bait, popper, or a hollow body frog or the wacky rig. But the hollow body frog is also a really good one, especially if you got all kinds of grass or or you've got all kinds of other stuff that, that may muck up a, a uh, bait with a treble hook. And then if it's really clear water and, and the fish really needs something finesse, a wacky rig really cannot be beat on a bluegill pattern. So those are the baits that I use uh, for that situation. And I can't, yeah, I, I, that is actually close to the end. So um, that is the end. Uh, so I know that it was frustrating for everybody that, that we started so late. I know that, that we, we kind of nailed it right on the head an hour, but we were 17 minutes late. Um, but I wanna say for you guys that showed up and you're gonna you're gonna have to leave now. Thank you so much for 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 showing up for this presentation. I hope th that you learned a lot. Uh, I'm gonna stay on here for everybody's questions that wants to stay on here and ask questions. So you're more than welcome to stay on. But for those of you that have to leave, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Again, um, this this is presented by Navionics. They did a great job um, uh, providing this platform, and you can go check out all of the the other webinars that are. are have been conducted by me and other uh, people on the pro staff on their YouTube channel, um, the Navionics YouTube channel. So thanks to them and thanks to you. So let's get to the Q&A se session right now. So any of those questions, I'm not gonna go back in the, in the line of questions here, but if you have any questions, um, uh, please feel free to, to drop a question there. Big shout out to John from uh, from Australia, man. Uh, thank you for your time all the way from over there. All right, Chris asked, will these slides be available later? Um, they will be once they are, re this this is all being recorded and it'll be posted on, on YouTube so you can see them there. If you have, <clears throat> if you want me to send them to you directly, um, just go ahead and, and send me an email at sonar at sonarfishing.com and I'll shoot you that the, the slides. <clears throat> All right, so the first question, do I fish a lot of uh, suspended bass during the summer? Uh, and thank you for, for the compliment. I appreciate it, man. Uh, Yes, a suspended bass can be one of the most uh, difficult fish to catch during the summertime, but um, especially, you know, on, on some of these, these current related lakes, a lot of times these fish will be kind of uh, spread out in some of these, these areas that don't have as much current, but the bait fish are kind of roaming around, and I will catch them suspended, but Overall, I'm, I'm catching fish that are relating to structure if I'm fishing offshore. Um, and, and fish that are suspended are really, really tough to catch, but I have been able to catch them on a, a spoon pretty well um, and uh, some other baits that, that you know, like swim bait that stays in the strike zone. Whoa, the questions are loading up here. Just a sec. No, no, no. Sorry, quiet. All right, thank you very much, Kevin. So, all right, so we got a question. Uh, in a system such as Norris Lake, I've been there once in, in Tennessee, uh, that has a distinct lake system and a separate, a separate dis, a distinct upriver system. How do you approach it? The way that I always approach any lake in the country, including Norris Lake, is I tend to focus on my strengths. Now, if I'm going to a lake other than my home lake here at Chickamauga, I'm going to focus shallow every single time. So I'm going to go up the river and try to, to try that first. If that fails, then I'll start focusing on some of the main lake stuff, 
further down the lake on Norris Lake, you know, the, the smallmouth population is a huge factor. Um, I'm not sure about during the, the, the heat of the summer, but I know during the spring, the smallmouth are a big deal. Um, so, so I'll have to like sometimes start fishing outside of my, my, um, my comfort zone a little bit in those situations. But generally, I'm going to try to fish shallow first. There's always going to be a shallow bite. Um, that's how I like to catch them. And I like to go shallow, flip and pitch, things like that up, up the river and start working my way down. There's no, you know, set answer for that, but that's what I would do. Um, my email was, is sonar at sonarfishing.com. That's S-O-N-A-R at sonarfishing.com. All right, good question, Douglas. Let's get back over here. Again, sorry for all the technical difficulties here. It must be a user issue. Um, I've done these a lot before. I've never had any issues at all. But um, uh, first off, thank you, Douglas. Um, said I asked about the sonar or downscan only because I'm not real familiar with them. Can you see grass better with downscan? Uh, no, I actually like 2D traditional sonar better for finding grass. And the reason for that is that, that 2D sonar tends to show you more information. So it's not good at target separation. You know, uh, you know, a, 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 a um, brush pile is going to look like a big old blob generally on your screen. Uh, but but with, when it comes to grass, it'll pick out the grass pretty well. So I'm just comfortable looking at a 2D sonar. Um, a down scan will show you the grass and side imaging will show you the grass, uh, but but uh, 2D sonar is going to show you um, the grass a lot easier. All right, I know I missed this question before, so I'm going to answer it. Uh, I have two Helix 7s on, on a John boat. Uh, shout out to having a John boat, man. I, that's how I started. Uh, I have a Navionics chip in the back one. Uh, would you use it in the front on the trolling motor depth finder or the main one? Definitely, definitely in both. Uh, you know, that's, I know that's a frustrating answer because, you know, with those, those helixes, you can't join them together and share the maps, but man, it is so important, you know, to have the mapping on both because, uh, you know, especially if you're fishing structure, it's so important to have uh, your mapping on the, on the front one where you're looking at it constantly. So it's a frustrating answer, means a little bit extra money, but um, it, it's definitely worth it. I would do it on both. If I had to choose between the two, though, I don't know. That's a that's a really tough question. I would have to say it would it, you know it would have to be on the back. So when you're driving, I mean, but still, I would feel I feel feel naked without it on the bow too. All right, Gary asked what uh, line to, uh, to rip through grass. Um, I generally use primarily, uh, uh, I tend to, to go a different route. You can go two different routes. With reaction baits, you can use a softer rod and use a, a, a less stretch line such as braid line. And that's a really good way to do it. Uh, braid is really good at ripping through grass, and it's and if you're just learning how to to get the feel of grass, I would try braid. Um, and if it's really really thick, definitely go to braid. But for normal circumstances where the grass is still under the water a bit, and I'm just trying to tick that grass, I'll use a heavier rod. I like a seven foot three inch a uh, medium heavy rod, which is you know a fast action rod, and uh, and I use a fluorocarbon line. It's got the perfect mixture. Of, of stretch and, uh, and, uh, and um, well, it's also low stretch, but it's got a little bit of stretch to it. And, uh, and it also sinks too, which I, I really like for keeping contact with that bait. So I generally use for submerged grass, um, uh, a fluorocarbon. And I, I use, I like to use a red label from Seaguar for that. And then if I'm talking about grass that's close to the surface or on the surface, it's 100% going to be braid. Again, man, it, it gets frustrating because I can't give you like a straight answer. I have to kind of, you know, tiptoe around some of the caveats. Uh, 
in a true river, where do you fish in the in the summer months after after mid morning? I like to to pick up the flipping stick or like a uh, or like a spinner bait, small spinner bait. And I like to go to the main river banks that are close to backwater areas. Um, so if you've got a backwater that's dumping into the main river, I'll start fishing around those those um, those the mouths of those backwaters, flipping and pitching any type of cover or structure that I can find visibly, and that's generally what I'll do. Sometimes I'll go into the backwaters, um, <clears throat> but on true river systems, it's all 100% shallow for me. I flip, pitch, throw you know shallow reaction baits, things like that. So I'll experiment from from main river um, a cover to to some backwater areas too. Because in rivers, they're always, always shallow. Oh man, Jonathan is in Afghanistan. Man, if you are a service member, thank you for your service. That is crazy that you're sitting here watching me. It's awesome. Hopefully, I didn't waste your time. Uh, Let me, uh, let me look here. So um, yeah, so I, I think what you're asking, is there a different way other than your phone? Um, so if you go to navionics.com, in fact, you know, since we've already been looking at it this entire time, let's go here. So navionics.com, they've got something called the chart viewer, which is really cheap. It's actually $0. And uh, so you can go on here and you can, search out any map they've got it's got every single map that navionics has you can go to any lake and check out anything you know and and go there so it's it's very similar to the the mobile app it doesn't have quite as many features but it has all the same mapping uh as as the uh the app so that's the way that i would do it hopefully that was the answer to your question and uh again thank you man So uh, Jim asked, what do you prefer on the business end of your, your Carolina rig? Uh, I personally like to um, throw everything in the boat, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, if it's clearer water, I like a bait that doesn't have a lot of action. So I'll, I'll usually, you know, go to a stick bait such as a Z-Man Zinkers um or you know straight tail worm you know like a, you know finesse worm or trick worm whatever you want to call it those are great baits and then as you get into the dirtier water or the situations where maybe those fish want something a little bit more action i'll throw a creature bait you know the the z-man makes something called a boar hogs that works really well um, there's a lot of different creature baits out there um, anything that's that has hog in the name probably will work <laughs> because uh you know there's a lot of great baits with within that creature bait category man i'm glad that you learned some new things derek i appreciate you being here man oh uh, so potomac river or other uh tidal areas do i focus on ledges or offshore <clears throat> i focus on grass 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 um, during the during the summertime on these type of fisheries. Again, I'm I'm really not a uh, a guru on these tidal fisheries, but generally when I'm going to the Potomac, I'm going to be fishing milfoil, um, and usually it's going to be offshore. Uh, and you really don't have to have a whole lot of of uh, depth changes and contours for an area to be good. It just the grass has to be good, and the bait fish have to be there, and you just have to go fish it. Um, so that's that's essentially you know my answer for that is just go fish grass, go uh, go cover a lot of water and find those areas that are holding the fish. But generally, I'm fishing the main river channel areas where the current is directly affecting those those areas and pulling through that grass. That's where I'm going to catch those fish. Um, Kevin asks, uh, I'm a big fan of the Ned rig and use it all the time. Are you using the Ned rig at all? What do you use? Uh, uh, what way do you use it? Yeah, I'm constantly having the Ned rig tied up. It's not always one of my my forerunners for you know the summertime, but it's always one of those ones that I'll pivot to if I'm having a hard time catching them on something else. And uh, and so I am a really big fan of just the traditional 
TRD with the um, a Pro Shrooms jig head. It's got a it's got a slightly bigger hook and a slightly stronger hook, and so I like fishing that one. Um, I'll also use the Nedlocks HD uh, jig head. That's actually pro actually probably my favorite, honestly. Um, that one's really good, and I like to fish it. You know, it, it, if if I'm catching them out on the ledges and they stop biting everything else, and I need to throw something. I'll throw that bait and I'll just slowly work it on the bottom. If I'm fishing around grass and they stop biting everything else, I might Texas rig it with that same jig head and then cast it like I would be casting like a jig or something else and just, you know, slowly hop it. So there's so many things that you can do with the, the Ned rig to catch fish. Um, but <clears throat> I definitely use it in all those different situations that we've talked about when I think that downsizing to that size is a good, good deal. Larry. I appreciate it, brother. Oh, he's gonna be a marshal next week. Hopefully, hopefully I draw you. That'll be fun. <clears throat> um, Shannon asks, "Man, you are Shannon. You you must you must be a professional or something, man, because you you're asking some good questions. Um, have you ever attempted to Demiki style fish for summer bass with uh, more appropriate size baits, since the fish are more?" are in similar places as they are in cold weather months. I've done it a little bit, to, I'll be honest. I haven't done it a whole lot. Generally, I'm, I'm picking up the drop shot, but that's just a personal preference. It's not, it has nothing to do with, um, you know, uh, any reason, you know, it's, it's just, I, I'm used to picking up the drop shot. But generally, if I am seeing them on the graph and they're feeding on bait fish, the Demiki can be very good. It's just something that, doesn't happen very often to where to where I've constantly got it tied on, but I'm sure there's situations where you can catch them. <clears throat> uh, John asks uh, about the creature lures. Uh, the Z-Man bait is called the Boar Hogs. That one's a good one. It's a smaller profile creature bait. Um, and then a lot of times I'll use a lizard too. Uh, you know, some type of lizard bait has is just the traditional Carolina rig um, uh, bait. It's got a lot of action and uh, it just it catches fish every time of the year. So I would switch between the lizard and that boar hogs or a boar hogs, a similar bait that has a lot of appendages. It's moving a lot and uh, and it just has a lot of action. Mitch, thank you. Jonathan, man. Thank you for your service again, and uh, and be safe out there, man. Appreciate you spending time with me. Uh, one more time on the email, it's sonar, S-O-N-A-R, at sonarfishing.com. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jonathan, I yeah, it's not going to pull up uh, coordinates on the, uh, on the uh, a chart viewer, I don't believe. Well, it might. No. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay. Yeah, it's so it's only on the apps. Unfortunately, you're just gonna have to get a bigger phone. Thanks, Mitch. Thank you, Eric. John. Thank you very much. When you come over to the USA, you come come say hi to me. I'd love to see you and maybe even go fishing with you. I'm, I'm going to try to make a trip over to Australia. It's one of my dream places. Other than the Huntsman Spider, you're going to have to kind of coax me into to hanging out around Huntsman's. All right, guys. It, it seems like everything's kind of toning down. Thank you very much, Todd, Shannon, everybody. I'm going to... Um, I'm going to go ahead and sign off here. Again, I'm honored that you guys took the time out to, to listen to me. If you have any questions, of course, you can visit me on all my social media pages, Sonar Fishing on Instagram. Uh, Miles Sonar Berghoff is my page on, on uh, Facebook. I've got a YouTube called Sonar Fishing. And of course, send me that email. So once again, thank you guys for your patience tonight. I will see you guys out on the water. Thank you. Mm -hmm.